And the topic of the presentation is implementing a well integrity management system. A couple of uh, acknowledgments. First, I have to acknowledge SPE for sponsoring the Distinguished Lecture Program. It's a great program. The, uh, at no charge to your section, you get up to three lecturers that will come from various places in the world and, and share their knowledge and experience with you. So uh, a great program for the lecturers. I had a wonderful time, met all sorts of great people, uh, heard all kinds of stories about well integrity. I can share a few with you. And just a wonderful experience if you've ever considered uh, participating in the program. I also have to acknowledge my employer, BP. I spent almost three months away from my normal job duties. And my supervisors, Doug Sismoski, uh, Steve Rosberg, and Gary Chrisman, were really, uh, really supportive of me taking that, that amount of time away from my, my normal job responsibilities. I have two objectives during this lunch today. First is to communicate why I think well integrity is important. And second is to describe the components of a well integrity management system. And the topics I'll go over is, since this is, a, this is a bit of a celebration of the Distinguished Lecturer Program, I'll share a few statistics of my experience in the program. We'll have a safety moment. I'll define well integrity. And I like to use a document called NORSOC D10. And we'll talk a bit about what the NORSOC document says. We'll have a failure case history. Then I'll go through the components of a, of a uh, well integrity system. We'll talk a bit about data management. And then depending on how our time's going, I have two underground blowout case histories we'll talk about. And then I'll leave you with a program checklist. In the lower right down, so you don't have to frantically write as I'm talking, there's a website, wellintegrity.net. And all the material in this presentation is from publicly available sources. And I have links to that information at that website. There are what I consider the SPE papers that directly relate to well integrity. Uh, there's links to those papers. There's links to the API standards, the NORSOC standards, and a number of vendor sites that have that specialize in, in tools and applications to help you manage well integrity. So free site, you're welcome to go there if you have to pull things up. Uh, this, I have some pictures of the failures as we go through the presentation. That picture you see on the right, uh, upper right corner, is uh, occurred during a a fill clean out in a water injector. Coil tubing was washing sand, uh, using nitrified fluids to wash sand out of a well. We were taking returns back to the production process. And if you look at this upper flange here, okay, we developed a leak here. High pressure fluid started jetting out, uh, laden with sand. And look what it did to this lower flange assembly, just washed through it, just like a knife cutting through butter. So a few statistics on my experience in the DL program. All the little yellow dots are where, uh, where the SPE sent me last year. I did 20 lectures. I had a chance to speak with three student chapters and do well integrity, well integrity uh, lectures there. I did 10 what we call health checks for my employer. 52 flights. And in those 52 flights, uh, I lost my luggage twice. And I uh, figured out real quick to live out of out of carry-on. So my longest time I was out of the U.S. was five weeks. So I lived for five weeks out of a box about that big. Uh, four times I had to drop my visa in the mail. And if anyone's had to get a U.S. passport recently, you know how unnerving that can be. But I've got my visa back, my passport back okay. Five times my host country didn't send someone to pick me up at the airport. That's great fun when, you're, when you've got this international cell phone and you have no clue what the right combination of numbers is to, to try to call the person that was supposed to pick you up. So if you're ever the person that's supposed to pick up a distinguished lecture in the airport, please pick them up. So. <laughs> but other than that, it was, again, a great experience. And I would highly encourage anyone that's interested in the program to, to uh, look into participating. OK, safety moment. Any issues with this well? One Sunday morning, I opened up our local newspaper, flipped to the business section, and I saw this picture, and I called my wife over. Leslie, look at this picture. And this is at 7 in the morning. She was like, okay, whatever. But what do you guys see that uh, jumps out at you as issues with this well? Missing a lot of stuff. Anything else? Water? Yep. <laughs> Hard hat? Well, let's... Uh, Let's run down the list of things I identified here. Missing tree valves. Now, that's not exactly the case. This looks like some sort of a dual unihead. So you do see a uh, 
you do see a master valve, wing valve, swab valve or crown valve. And what you hope is, I guess the good news is the valve handles have been removed, so hopefully it would be difficult for someone to actuate those valves. Populated area, you know, we have an issue in populated areas with what we call hardening of locations where we won't have theft. I don't see any fences or gates or anything to prevent folks from, from removing materials from this well. Missing lockdown screws. Now, that's interesting that someone would uh, actually go up and start pulling out the, uh, the, the lockdown screw. In this case, look at this one. They took the packing gland out from around it. Now, without doubt, it's missing annulus valves. And that can be pretty, pretty concerning because if we develop a leak in our tubing and there's pressure on the tubing, then it would have a flow path straight out the side of that side outlet nozzle on that wellhead. Exposed VR plug. I guess the good news is at least it's got a plug in it. And I'm not sure if this is oil or water from the picture. Hopefully it's uh, not oil. Uh, one question, is this Alaska? No. Why is it not Alaska? What, what clue in the picture do you have? Yep, we don't have palm trees in Alaska. So. And what I ask myself when I get on a, a location and I see something like this, who is the accountable person for this well? And we'll talk a bit more about accountable, responsible, responsible and how those are defined. But the accountable person is the position that ensures things get done. They control the resources, and they're the ones that make sure that the necessary tasks are actually being accomplished. And we'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a few moments. Let's define well integrity, and the best definition I've seen of well integrity is from that NORSOC D10 document. NORSOC is a standard setting agency in Norway, and they've written this really good technical uh, document on how to manage well integrity. Uh, there's actually a collection of, of very high quality documentation on their website, and they're all free. And I, I like to go through this, through this, uh, definition backwards, so I'm going to go from the back forward. Life cycle of a well. So well integrity isn't just when there's a rig on the well drilling it. We're, we want to think of well integrity as occurring during the completion phase, during the operating phase when someone's driving around in a pickup truck looking for leaks on the wellhead components or the tree components or the or uh, you know annulus pressure where it shouldn't be. When we do well interventions or case toll work, uh, we want to make sure we have the proper procedures and competent people to do the, do the task, and then during abandonment. So well integrity is, is throughout the life cycle of the well, and what we're trying to do is prevent the uncontrolled release of formation fluids. So think about this. When we drill a well, we're drilling into hydrocarbon accumulations, and they're under temperature and pressure. And what we do is we take this pressure sealing envelope that's containing those hydrocarbon mixtures, and we extend that pressure sealing envelope to the surface. And what you see at the surface are your tree and wellhead components, and what's more difficult to see are all the tubulars. But that the key concept here is we have this extended pressure sealing envelope, and if we have some failure in that envelope, whether it's a downhole or a surface, we could have formation fluids release, either to atmosphere or to uh, subsurface formation. Now, the tools we have to manage the, the integrity of that, of that pressure sealing envelope, technical, operational, and organizational. Now, I think technical is by far the easiest of them. If I have some sort of metallurgy problem or cementing problem or something of that nature, I can find a vendor and we can do a research project and we can, we can come up with technical solutions to most problems. Operational is what does that person do when, in the field when they're confronted with some scenario that, that indicates there's a well integrity problem. So, for example, uh, a field operator sees high annulus pressure. Who does he report it to? Does he report it? And then once it's reported, does it get acted on? Organizational is another difficult one. In Alaska, we have 2,500 wells, we have 10 different business units, and we have functional groups that work across all the business units. Getting those units to communicate and share information can be very, very difficult. So you want to have an organizational construct superimposed over your fields that 
promote that sharing of information. One section that I had the opportunity to visit, it took a 20-minute uh, walk across their campus to get to the drilling department. It, made, it was very difficult to share information. So the most effective teams I've seen uh, to deal with these organizational issues are where you can actually have your teams in close physical proximity where it's very easy to, to, to communicate problems and share issues and sh come up with shared solutions. Here's an example of another well failure. This is a well that produces about 20 million cubic feet of gas per day, 700 PSI flowing tubing pressure. When the well was shut in, the shut-in tubing pressure increased to about 2,500 PSI. And the wellhead frosted up. Now, we have lots of frosted up wellheads in Alaska, but it was pretty unusual for this to happen. The operator reported through our well integrity reporting systems that the wellhead frosted up. We sent our downhole diagnostic technicians out to investigate, and what they found was there was a crack in the tubing hanger coupling right about here. And so when the well was shut in, that 2,500 PSI started to leak from the tubing into the A annulus. There was a Joule Thompson effect and a cooling effect, and the wellhead frosted up. And then we set a plug, depressured the well, and then a rig work over fixed the well. So the system worked in this case. Our field operator saw something anomalous. It was reported. Engineers followed up on it. A field crew investigated, determined what the problem was. The intervention team set plugs and then fixed the tubing. This emphasizes, again, well integrity isn't just during the drilling phase of a well. Design, drill, complete, operate, produce, during your well interventions, when you're doing case tow work, and finally abandonment. You have to consider how what you're doing in any one phase of the well, how it will affect other phases of the well. We can learn a lot from the aviation industry. So consider these statistics. Normally in the U.S., we have about 50,000 traffic fatalities per year. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting. In 2008, they're predicting that number to be in the mid-30,000s because of the higher price of gasoline and, and the reduced mileage people are driving. But if you take the 50,000 divided by 365, that's roughly 130 fatalities per day. And that's about the capacity of an airplane. So for the aviation industry to have a fatality rate similar to the automobile industry, a plane a day would have to drop out of the sky. And you don't see that. And so the question is, what is, is the aviation industry doing that we might be able to learn from? So think about what happens when you get on an airplane. You, the plane's clean, and you look to your left, and there's maybe an old guy and a young guy in a cockpit, and they have college degrees, and they have training in emergency procedures. And if a light comes on in the cockpit, they don't just fly off anyway. They contact a mechanic who has checklists that tells them what's okay and not okay. And if there's a problem with those checklists, they don't just scratch it out and do something different. That procedure goes back to the engineering team that updates the the procedure, and then it goes back out to the field. Lots of rigor around competency of people that operate the equipment, how it's maintained, uh, emergency procedures, and just a nice, and you don't see planes very rarely crash in the U.S. So let's look at a failure case history. First, let's, let's talk about some nomenclature. I've used a, a bit of slang so far. This is my tubing strain. This is my production casing. This is my surface casing. And this would be my conductor pipe. And the annular space between my tubing and my production casing, I'll call the A annulus. And between my production and surface casing, I'll call the B annulus. It's pretty standard nomenclature. That's what most folks use. Uh, in Alaska, we use uh, some non-standard nomenclature. We use inner annulus, outer annulus. I saw one place that actually numbered their annuli from the outside in. That would be the A, B. They would call this the C annulus. But most folks do A, B, C. During well startup, the B annulus pressure on this well increased to 7,700 PSI. And what you see on the left is a picture of the failed surface casing. It was recovered, and this split is where the casing failed. Classic burst. You see thinning along the edges. The split is along the axis of the pipe. That high-pressure fluid, okay, so this piece of pipe that you see was located right here. That's my surface casing. That high-pressure fluid flowed up between, up the annular space between my surface casing and conductor, and it 
vented into the well house. This is a picture of the results of that of that venting of gas. Now, we have uh, boards that lay across these cellars, and when that high-pressure gas vented up that annular space, it jetted up into our, our into our well area, and it took all those boards and mobilized them and basically threw them up into the air. So look carefully right there. Anybody see something missing from that point? I know it's a little difficult to see, but what's missing from that that a annulus valve? My jewelry, my needle valve, and my pressure gauge. So when those boards were mobilized and went flying in the well house, they knocked off my annulus jewelry. Now we keep our annulus valves open so we can monitor our annulus pressures. So once this this uh, was uh, no longer present, we had our 2,000 psi lift gas venting out this quarter inch diameter hole. So we had the initial release of the high pressure fluid from the B annulus. The jewelry that contains my A annulus pressure was knocked off and now I have a secondary gas release of, of gas lift gas from my A annulus. Found an ignition source and you can see the result outside. It uh, blew the well house apart. Unfortunately, the pad operator who maintains the well was on location at the time. He was standing over here by his pickup truck the force of the blast uh, blew him over in this area. He had to pull himself on his elbows over to this area. And then a fellow operator who saw the flash and heard the explosion uh, traveled to the location and, and took him to a medical facility. Very, very serious incident. And I just want to be clear on the physics of what happened here. This well was started up. The initial temperature of the well was 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And the initial pressure in that B annulus was 2,000 PSI. And, and keep that in mind for a moment. 2,000 PSI is a lot of B annulus pressure. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. This well, when it was started up, heated from 45 degrees Fahrenheit to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And when fluid heats up, it expands. So as the fluid expanded, it pushed the fluid level in that B annulus up. And we can we know what the fluid level was initially. It was about 80 feet down. That fluid level was pushed up to about 40 feet. So this gas cap, its volume was decreased from 80 feet to 40 feet, and it was heated from 45 to 115 degrees. So when you take gas at 2,000 psi and you heat it and you compress it and you start at 2,000, you end up with a final pressure of 7,700 psi. That's how you get... Very, very high. This is a really busy diagram. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's called a causal diagram. What it does is help represent the different, the different components that lead to an accident or to a failure. Down at the bottom, we have the physical sequence of events, high annulus pressure, well was started up, pressure not bled, failure, operator near the well house, and then we had a severe injury. And these are all the contributing factors, training and procedures, reporting system for anomalies, uh, where, what sort of local audits do you have? What sort of company audits? Applicable regulations. This just helps to see in a more two-dimensional framework the type of things that impact uh, why you have accidents. But in a more linear fashion, when we investigated this, and then we had a regulatory agency in Alaska conduct an investigation also. These are the things that they identified as contributing factors to this. What sort of training did the operator have? Were they aware of the potential for high annulus pressures due to fluid expansion? Do procedures to start wells up address this type of issue where you have high initial starting pressures and uh, what's, what do your procedures say about how to manage that? When you see a, a problem with the well, how are they reported and then how are they followed up on? And then doesn't it seem a bit odd that you would operate a well with 2,000 PSI on the B annulus? What sort of risk assessment was done and what engineering review was conducted that authorized continued operation with those kind of pressures? Those operators had three well pads over about a 10 square mile area. So is it realistic to expect an individual to, to safely operate up to 150 wells over a large geographic area? And then getting back to that accountability and responsibility, uh, who, is re who ensures that we have all the processes in place we need to effectively manage those those wells. And then audit processes, who comes in and checks your systems to ensure you have all the processes in place to, to effectively manage your wells. 
So let's step through the six components of a, of a well integrity management system. Accountability, responsibility, yet again. Well operations, well interventions. The first three are process oriented. The last three are more barrier system maintenance oriented. A tubing annulus monitoring program. What sort of maintenance systems do you have for your wellhead and trees? And then your safety valve program. That picture you see on the right, we have an issue with wells developing leaks at the bottom of our wellheads where these wellheads attach to our surface casing. Now, in the Arctic, everywhere I go, there are unique issues to every wells. In the Arctic, our issue is permafrost and we have frozen ground. That means we can't put freezable fluids into our annuli. So the fluid in our bee annulus is either diesel or crude oil or some other non-freezing fluids. When we develop a leak at this surface casing wellhead intersection, the, um, the fluid we have leaking out uh, is oil. And so we have to fix that. And what, we're sh uh, what I'm showing here is a, a weld process where we preheat the wellhead and then the welder comes in and does a seal weld around the bottom. Accountability and responsibility. Again, the accountable person makes sure it's get done. And more importantly, they control the resources. What you'll hear from people that are responsible, the ones that do the work, is they have a full plate and you ask them to do another task and they'll say things like, okay, I'm doing all these tasks, which ones are going to come off my plate? That accountable person is the one that ensures there's enough resources to get things done. Now, there's a lot of tasks associated with managing a well integrity program. We use something called RACI charts to ensure that all the tasks that need to be done are identified, and then we have clear assignment of who's going to do them. RACI stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consultant Form. So we list all of our tasks, and then across the top, we list the positions of the, of the uh, folks that are going to ensure things are getting done or are actually going to do the task. Very helpful in large organizations, especially where you have a lot of movement of people between teams. They can step into a new position, and they've got these defined tasks for them. They can pretty quickly identify what they need to be doing. Here's an opportunity to benchmark your organization against what we've implemented in Alaska. This is our well integrity team. We have a, what we call our well integrity technical authority. He's our wells manager. We have a well integrity team leader and a downhole corrosion engineer, and they're located in our Anchorage office. Up on, our, up on the slope in our field office, we have a well integrity coordinator, and that's the position I held for 10 years. And then working for them, we have three well integrity engineers. One engineer does special projects and wellhead repairs. They have a wellhead technician that works for them. Uh, under the well integrity engineer that manages the downhole diagnostic crew, they have a team of field technicians that go out and do diagnostic work. And then we have a well integrity technician that helps us with our paperwork. So, so let's count the, the positions for a moment. We've got in the field, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we have seven field technicians, so that's 14. Now, these folks work at two weeks on, two weeks off. So you have to multiply this by two. So we have 28 people involved in well integrity operations on the slope. Uh, in my travels in the DL program, I had a chance to to visit with folks about how they do things. I haven't seen many operations that, that meet the scope of, of this. I have seen dedicated field technicians and dedicated well integrity engineers. So I would, in my travels as I visited with folks, I would propose this. The organizations I've visited with that did not have a dedicated well engineer, well integrity engineer, I did not see anything that really looked like a well integrity program. Until you have someone in your organization assign the responsibility of, of implementing a well integrity program, it's really difficult to see anything that, that you would call a well integrity program. So keep that in mind as we go through some more of these slides and then a checklist at the end. Well operations. It's important that during all phases of a well's life, it's clear who has ownership of that well. So when it's handed over from drilling to operations to the well interventions team and then back to operations, how is it handed over? How is the status of that well communicated? Are the people operating that well competent? Do they, have they been trained? And do they understand all the issues that go along with operating wells? Procedures to start up, shut down, and then some sort of erosion corrosion management program. Uh, the pictures you see here, that one on the upper right, that's a collapsed gas lift mandrel. It was from an offshore location. During well startup, the A annulus pressure was not monitored, uh, and the, the pressure increase flattened out the gas lift mandrel. 
basically the well never produced anything. As soon as the rig completed the well it was on, it just skidded back over, pulled the tubing on this well. So that well never produced anything uh, with that completion. The two pictures on the bottom are demonstrating external surface casing corrosion. Uh, and the way we patch them in Alaska is in that lower left picture. You'll see where we excavate, expose the bad section of casing, and then well patches on. Well interventions, you see the same themes or similar themes. Well ownership handover, are the people operating those slick line, E line, uh, your case toll intervention equipment, are they trained and competent procedures for all the well in, uh, intervention uh, activities? And that bottom checkbox, I was at a presentation yesterday and they were talking about they had these wells shut in. They didn't really know why. Their records were bad. It's really important that all your well service or your well intervention events get documented in a format where you can access them at some time in the future. So we have electronic systems that have all of our well service events go into a database and then you can pull them up through various reporting systems. Okay, these last three bullets are more focused not on the processes and people but more on maintenance, maintenance of that pressure containing envelope. Tubing annulus program. This is, the, this is the component that you can't see or put your hands on. All we really have to go by are the pressures that we can monitor at the surface. So assigned operating pressure limits. What's the max pressure you're going to allow on an annulus before it gets reported as an anomaly? And when something strange is noted in the field, how does it get reported? And then who's going to follow up on it? And then it, what makes this difficult is every one you have to understand the risk associated with the different well types and their flow capacities and, and the rate of leaks. And let's talk about that a bit more. Uh, this is one of the things that causes some of the most confusion uh, about analyzing your, your downhole barrier systems. Or analysis of downhole barrier systems can be very confusing. Uh, if this document, NORSOC D10, has a really good discussion about how to methodically go through your barrier systems and better define what's acceptable and not acceptable. So the NORSOC approach uses this concept of primary and secondary barrier systems. And it's a pretty straightforward concept. Basically, if whatever is holding pressure fails, where is that pressure going to go to, and how is that newly pressure component going to act? So in this case, let's say I develop a tubing leak, and I have pressure that leaks from my tubing into my A annulus. I'm now going to pressure up my production casing and a number of wellhead components. Well, how will those newly pressure components react to that pressure? Now, where this gets difficult is things like acceptance criteria. How much can it leak and still be okay? How do you test a barrier system? And how do you identify if that barrier system has lost its competency? So, for example, if I've had external corrosion eat a hole in my production casing, how do I identify that my production casing is no longer a competent secondary barrier system, in particular before I have a leak develop in my tubing and pressure that, that production casing or my A annulus up? Wellhead and tree maintenance. Another opportunity to benchmark your operation against uh, another, another uh, area. Our tree and wellhead valves get serviced twice per year. And when you service a valve, that means you repack the body cavity with grease. You displace all the any produced fluids that have accumulated out. You uh, cycle the valve. You make sure that the valve stem and the, the, all the mechanisms in the valve all work correctly. And we have a dedicated wellhead tech to handle any, any leaks that develop on our wellheads. So here's a couple of pieces of technology. Before a rig shows up on location, we always check our lockdown screws to make sure that they, uh, they back out. We've had stuck lockdown screws and uh, we're unable to back them out. And so a rig sits on a location for a few days while we drill lockdown screws. So this is a 1,200 foot-pound torque wrench. Anybody recognize this thing here? Anybody want to speculate what that is? It's a torque multiplier, a four to one torque multiplier. You notice this guy, this technician doesn't have a cheater pipe. So we have a 1,200 foot pound torque wrench, a four to one torque multiplier. So he can put 4,800 foot pounds of torque on that lockdown screw to try to break it free if it's stuck. When we do find them stuck, we drill them out. And we have an alignment plate, and this is called a mag drill. And this is a magnetic plate that attaches the drill to the alignment jig, and then we're able to, to drill these out before the rig shows up on location. Safety valve program. We have surface safety valves on all producers, downhole safety valves on our gas injectors and all of our offshore wells. They're tested every six months. Uh, this is a failed surface safety valve, and you notice 
here, this shiny area on the bonnet assembly, this this uh, actuator barrel should be snug up against that rig, that uh, that shoulder. What's happened is we no longer use fusible caps or shipping caps to lock our safety valves out during well intervention activities. We actually take control of the safety valve barrel. So we will run a hose from our safety valve barrel to our to our well intervention equipment, slick line or E-line, and then they actually pump the barrel open and they'll maintain pressure on this barrel during their during their intervention activities. Our early designs, we didn't have a relief valve on the system. And this hose was coiled up and sun was shined on it and the pressure got up to around 10,000 PSI in that hose and it actually failed the circlip inside the barrel and it, it caused this barrel to, uh, to, to blow off the, the valve. So since then, we've gone back and retrofitted relief valves in all of our, our safety valve control panels. So just a, a cautionary note about serial number one type installations. We thought we had this system pretty well designed, but it seems like you always learn from, uh, from things once you actually get them in the field. A quick comment on data management. Data management is really important. As you learn things about wells, you want to be able to document them in a format where other people can access them. Uh, we have a program called Digital Well File. It works great. It's a web-based application. You can put your well name in at the top. You can click on well bore schematic, well integrity information, operator notes. Uh, I've noticed as I've been through the exhibition hall, there's a number of vendors that have similar products. You know, we're, there's an information technology revolution going on. If you're still having to go back to paper well files and, and dig through them to find well information, really there's a lot better way to do things. It's painful to get to this point, but once you get your data in a format where it's queryable, it's, uh, you can't imagine going back to anything else. I get calls all the time from folks in other business units asking how we can take some of the systems we've developed and expand them to other units. Okay, let's talk about a couple of couple of additional well integrity failure case histories. This one's in Algeria. So think here for a moment. From zero to 450 meters, we have overburden. And then from 450 to 650, we have salt. Okay, so, so get this picture in your mind. We have 200 meters of salt, 450 meters to 650 meters. And if you've ever been to... Uh, Kuala Lumpur, that's about the height of the, uh, the uh, KL Twin Towers. This well was drilled. They lost the original well bore, and it was then sidetracked. And the original well bore was not plugged. And what happened is cross flow started washing this salt away, started dissolving the salt. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and the overburden collapsed. And when it collapsed, it really collapsed. I got these pictures from a colleague of mine that was working for a pumping company at the time. They pumped thousands of yards of cement around the perimeter of this to try to slow the rate of growth. Uh, it's about 80 meters deep, 200 meters across. It's continuing to grow. Uh, more of these are, are popping up in the desert. If you get into Google Earth and look around a bit, you can find these little splotches on the landscape. So I'm a bit curious about this. Who has heard of the mud volcano in Indonesia? Oh, about a third of the group. Basically, look at the date. May of 06. Gosh, that was over two years ago. Essentially, they took a kit and they lost control of the well. And if you read the, the, if you get on the internet and you start reading more information about this, there's a lot of controversy about what exactly happened, uh, whether they pushed a casing set point or there may have been an earthquake. But regardless, they lost control of the well. Look at that second from the bottom bullet. 500 acres of land currently subsiding, 60 meters or 60 centimeters within a year's time. So let's take a look at this thing. There it is. This is mud. This is not water. This is what they call the mud volcano, and it's basically an eruption of mud that has flooded this area. 15,000 people displaced, and there it is. So what do you do when you have something like that? Well, here's what they tried, dropping concrete spheres over the top. They strung a cable across the top of this thing and started dropping these concrete balls. It actually plugged it off for about half a day. And then what happened is it broached around the balls and came up in another location. There was a proposal at one time to build a 70-meter high levee around this thing and let it fill itself up. The problem is, once they get it plugged off in one place, it just broaches up in another. 
So there's essentially, what they're doing now is they're maintaining a path to the ocean. You see these track hose? They just keep digging and they keep it dug out to where it can flow to a nearby river and it flows to the ocean. Half a billion dollars is what's been spent. Last time I checked on the internet about six months ago and no end in sight. So why is well integrity important? So we're looping around to the two objectives I had for this presentation. We don't want to hurt our colleagues. We don't want to damage the environment. That's a $3 million picture to recover that piece of casing. It can be very, very expensive. The liability that comes along with failures can be company killers. And then I have a 19-year-old daughter studying electrical engineering in Alaska. I've just thoroughly enjoyed my career in the oil industry. I'd like to see her have a future in it, too. So as we put this equipment in the ground, we want things that are going to last so our successors will have equipment to work with and uh, you know, there's a future for them in this industry also. So here's a checklist. So there's a few things to take with you as you go back to your operation. So let's run down them real quick. So think about this. In your organization, who is assigned accountability and responsibility for well integrity? And then you have to have a team approach. There has to be a collaborative effort between all the different groups involved in well integrity, whether it's drilling, your interventions team, or your operations team. Who comes in periodically and gives you feedback on how your uh, organization is doing on managing well integrity? Your system should cover design to abandonment. Do you have people that know what they're doing? Do you have procedures that cover all your activities in the field? Do you have a program to monitor your uh, downhole barrier systems, primarily monitoring your annulus pressures, and then someone on the engineering side to respond to anomaly reports? And then how do you maintain your tree, wellhead, and safety valve equipment? So that's the presentation. So let's see if I can get through all these. Shukran, Shishya, Salamat, Gracias, and Trima Kasi. Just a few of the languages I had a chance. I'm sorry, how do you say it in Portuguese? Obrigado. That's in Portuguese. So thanks.